Hi, good morning. My name is Mike Duran. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Um, and this is a panel discussion we're having this morning on the war in the Caucasus. What does it mean for America? I, I am delighted to, to be joined today by three very distinguished panelists, uh, Ambassador Matt Bryza, Dr. Brenda Schaefer, and Mr. Ahmed Obali. Uh, they have all agreed that I don't have to read their long and distinguished <laughs> bios, so we're just going to jump right into the discussion. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador. You uh, are the former U.S. Ambassador to, uh, to Azerbaijan, uh, and you were also um, the representative uh, of the United States uh, to the Minsk group. Uh, and uh, there's nobody, I think, in America who is better informed about the uh, war uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, than you are. I benefited greatly during the war, I, my, my understanding of it, uh, by listening to your commentary. Uh, and so I wonder if you could just start us out and uh, uh, give us um, uh, uh, a sense of uh, why the war developed in the way that it did. Um, in particular, um, in your writing, you've talked about the, the, uh, uh, the discipline, uh, the strategic uh, uh, patience and focus of mm. President Aliyev of Azerbaijan. Um, and I wonder if you could just develop for us now that, that analysis that I've seen in your writing. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dranner, if I may say, Mike. Th and thank you for all of our amazing exchanges of thoughts. And you, you really have helped me advance my own thinking in a profound way. So, um, well, first of all, I, I don't think that Azerbaijan was spoiling for this war. I think it, it found itself in a situation where it was, or its leadership was, really frustrated that the negotiating process that they'd been involved with since you know the mid-1990s had broken down. Uh, and, it, and it broke down, in, in, in my opinion, because uh, the prime minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, was unable at home in Armenia to consolidate his, his political strength and stick with the no negotiating format that had been agreed in already in 2009. You know, the basic uh, elements of it or the ba basic principles had been agreed by the leadership at that time of both Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I think there were uh, people in Armenia and there have been since, you know, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union who really didn't want a settlement. And they pushed him into a provocative uh, posture, and we can talk about that later. So um, Azerbaijan found itself in a situation, and based on my reading, where it felt the negotiating process was dead, and that the prime minister of Armenia had shifted away from a general formula of land for peace, a classic you know conflict resolution formula, to, as he put it in his own words, new territories for new wars. And so Again, we can go into these details new, later on. But new, war, new wars for new territories. New wars for new territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, new wars for new territories. Exactly. Um, and so the way the war broke out, I, th I think in the beginning, as you and I have discussed many, many times, Mike, um, I think in the beginning, the Azerbaijani side had limited objectives. I think what it wanted to do was to regain um, a couple of its districts that had been occupied by Armenia and then go to the return of the negotiating table from a position of strength. And its goal, keeping in mind von Clausewitz's dictum that war is a continuation of politics by other means, was to use military force to reshape a political situation that would obtain for Azerbaijan what it wanted, which was the agreement that I mentioned before that had been preliminarily uh, accepted by the leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia. What was that? It was that the seven territories around Nagorno-Karabakh that were occupied by Armenia would go back to Ar uh, Azerbaijan's control lands back to Azerbaijan. The Armenian residents of Nagorno-Karabakh, of Nagorno-Karabakh itself, would get peace. They'd get security guarantees and a peacekeeping force. And uh, in, the sh in the immediate term, a, a, an interim legal status for Nagorno-Karabakh, something that was ambiguous, constructively ambiguous. Um, the Armenians could claim that meant that Nagorno-Karabakh was no longer part of Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijanis could claim, of course, it's part of Azerbaijan. So use that constructive ambiguity and then you say that, okay, sometime in the future, we don't know when, there'll be a vote of the residents of Nagorno-Karabakh on the final legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh. So it was lands for peace, and then this, this idea that there could be uh, a change in the legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Okay, that, 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 those were the political objectives Azerbaijan was seeking. And to get there in the beginning, I think they only believed they needed to regain a couple of their lost districts. As we talked about many times, Fuzuli, Jabril, I think that was maybe, maybe a couple more areas was the limit of their ambitions. But it turned out that the combination of Turkish and Israeli uh, UAVs and Turkish tactics were remarkably successful in defeating and decimating the Armenian military forces. So the Armenia had dug in with concrete reinforcements and all kinds of heavy weapons, artillery and S-300 air defenses. And the tactics from Turkey and the UAVs from Israel and Turkey were able to neutralize those capabilities of the Armenians and attrit them step by step to the point that finally there became a moment in mid-October, as, as you recall from our conversations, where the Azerbaijani forces broke through and moved all the way along the Iranian border to almost to the Armenian border of Azerbaijan or the occupied territories. Um, that was a huge surprise, uh, I, I think, even for the leadership of Azerbaijan. So then it was a, the, the decision was, how far does Azerbaijan go, getting to the point of strategic restraint? Um, certainly, Azerbaijan wanted to, to push north. But we know from a remarkable interview that Vladimir Putin gave that on the night of 1920 October, after the, just after the Azerbaijanis had broken through along the Iranian border, Putin discussed with both Aliyev and Pashinyan, can there be a ceasefire? Aliyev said, yes, but we need to push all the way to the north, not deeply into Nagorno-Karabakh, but just to recover the city of Shusha. And Shusha, uh, as anybody who follows this conflict knows, is of deep, tremendous cultural uh, importance to both Azerbaijanis and Armenia, Armenians. And it really matters in a, in a sort of an operational sense because it sits above the current capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, it's the commanding heights, and it's um, uh, a capture by Armenia during the, the, the first Karabakh war was the decisive turning point. So what, what Putin said, as, as he describes it to Pashinyan was, you can retain Shusha, you can keep Azerbaijan out of Nagorno-Karabakh, but you have to agree that Azerbaijanis can return to Nagorno-Karabakh and live al alongside Armenians as, as you, your country has previously agreed under these basic principles. And Pashinyan said no. And mm -hmm. so the, the war continued, the fighting continued, and it became brutal. And you know, as, as the Azerbaijanis pushed north, this is rugged, hilly, forested terrain. I, I, I've been in many, many times. And the, the fighting became largely hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the vast majority of injuries, it's so brutal, were, were stab wounds. I mean, the, 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 you know, of the soldiers taken back to Sepanakir Hankendi. It was brutal fighting. The Azerbaijanis prevailed. Their special forces scaled the cliffs beneath Shusha, regained Shusha. And at that point, and I'm almost done, this is my last point. At that point about strategic restraint, Aliyev faced a choice. Does he follow public opinion in Azerbaijan and push militarily all the way in, recapture Stepanakert, Hankendi, depending on whether you're Azerbaijani or Armenian, and then even further and regain all of that territory of Nagorno-Karabakh by force, or do you stop and realize you've won the military phase of the war and negotiate from a position of strength and save hundreds, maybe thousands of lives of Azerbaijani and Armenian soldiers and even Armenian civilians? It was an unpopular decision at first, but Aliyev decided we're going to stop. He did. And from that position of extreme strength was able to negotiate the November 910 uh, uh, agreement, which I believe is going to be stable and is going to hold. So I'll, I'll hold there as well. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that's great. I'll, when I come back to you in a bit, I'm going to ask you about the, uh, uh, the negotiations between Vladimir Putin and, uh, and Aliyev. Uh, and 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 also why you believe that this is that this was going to hold and uh, what advantages it has to the to the parties and also to the United States. Um, from now, I'd like to uh, move to uh, Dr. Schaefer. Um, Dr. Schaefer is an expert on uh, the Caucasus um, and on energy, uh, also on the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. Uh, she's also well versed in uh, Israeli relations with Azerbaijan, so we'll investigate that too. But, Dr. Schaefer, let me start with uh, with you, um, and and just ask if you can lay out uh, the 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 energy landscape from a strategic point of view. Why why this conflict matters from an energy point of view, and 
Uh, I wonder if I could have you start uh, from something that I uh, read in one of your articles, which is that you see this conflict actually, uh, this, this round of the, of the conflict, uh, this war that we just had, as starting not in September, but in July. And may maybe that would be a good point to start about the connection between the, the energy and strategy. Okay, and thank you for convening this uh, panel. Um, yes, I see the September fighting as phase two of fighting that began uh, on July 12th. So on July 12th, in an unexpected uh, attack, Arme Armenian forces attacked uh, Azerbaijani forces and Azerbaijani civilians about 300 kilometers north of, uh, of, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and the wider occupied territories uh, in the region of Tavuz, a, su a surprise, uh, surprise attack. Um, and this fits in line exactly with, with what uh, Ambassador Bryza was talking about before uh, of uh, Totonian, the defense minister of Armenia's uh, clearly articulated doctrine of uh, new wars for new territories. So simply on this night of July 12th, Armenia opened two new fronts with Azerbaijan, one in the north in Tavuz, one they actually also shelled intensively at Nakhchivan. It got a, lot, a little less reporting, but they opened up that front as well. Um, and it, in after a, a, lot, a pre, pretty serious loss of life, uh, Azerbaijan was able to repulse these attacks. But um, Armenians had already released that they had uh, uh, achieved, that, that, that they had captured the heights that are basically over the Southern Gas Corridor, the BTC, the main energy and transport corridor uh, uh, between Azerbaijan and, and the West, um, one of the only you know, transport and energy corridors that doesn't go through Russia or Iran that, that's, that's in the region. So it was clear that even though they weren't correct that they had held these, these hills, this was their goal. And even after they were repulsed, the Armenian officials had said quite, you know, kind of arrogantly that um, we've proved to Europe that we control actually European energy security. And now you have to deal with Armenia and not deal with Azerbaijan. So can you imagine this situation um, that two new fronts have been open the defense minister of Armenia has made it clear that the doctrine was new, you know, new wars for new territories. And he says explicitly, especially in his meeting in 2018 with members of the American Armenian diaspora, that we need to open new fronts uh, uh, with Azerbaijan so that President Aliyev uh, will be deterred from ever attacking us in the occupied territories because it's clear to them, especially after 2016, that they don't have a perfect uh, military situation, then they have some vulnerabilities. So their idea was open up new fronts um, and not be attacked where they're vulnerable. Well, actually, if you're the Azerbaijani side, you know what you have to do and you actually have to attack them where they're vulnerable. Um, you can't, I, don't, I can't imagine any country, especially one that had probably what, you know, what is obvious today, military superiority that would agree to opening of two new fronts and just accept that situation. That's an impossible strategic situation. You know, that was definitely, and so, so what happened in sep September was a continuation of the attacks of uh, July. And, and uh, um, obviously with the results of the war, uh, uh, Azerbaijan's deterrence has been uh, restored. The energy corridors are not under any threat. But again, uh, um, you know, as uh, El Shad Nasirov had, had said a couple of days after these attacks, that um, it's not by chance that a few weeks before the operational opening of the Southern Gas Corridor in October, um, you know, Armenia made these attacks. And again, Armenian officials quite openly said that this was part of their uh, strategy. Sorry, can I uh, can I just interrupt you yeah. there for a second for the yeah. people who are uh, uh, people who are, aren't following this uh, uh, closely? What is the strategic significance of the what is the Southern Gas Corridor and what's the strategic significance of it? Right. So in the last decade, there have been a variety of pipelines and infrastructure that's been opened in Europe that basically reroutes existing supplies, whether it's Russian supplies or North African supplies, but it's on pipeline, there's been very few in, in projects, there's no, no projects that bring in new volumes, meaning additional gas into Europe. So um, the Southern Gas Co Corridor, which was, a, which was a, articulated the idea in 2010, um, opens up massive infrastructure that brings the first new gas volumes into Europe in decades. And it also can facilitate in the future additional gas volumes. So it could be from the East Med, it could be uh, from cent Central Asia. So it's sort of like a super 
super highway once it's built a lot of new you know a lot of new roads can be built on the super highway so this became operational in october uh, commercially op technically operational and it's actually going to open uh it, it, it has opened uh in december um and actually it's pretty amazing below budget uh on time you know despite the wars and despite the attacks and despite all the things uh you know happening in the in the region and what is the what is the route of the southern gas corridor so the southern gas corridor today that this first part of it goes um from the caspian sea through azerbaijan through georgia through turkey uh, through Greece, Albania, and uh, it, it meets a uh, final ending point in Italy, which is a huge anchor uh, market. It's important also to point out as much as we think about, you know, all these conflicts between Greece and Turkey, here they're interlinked and partners and this massive, you know, project, uh, you know, the, all this went ahead and smoothly between Greece and Turkey. So it gives a little hope that in other arenas they can actually improve as well. Um, but it, this, of course, is a strategic shift uh, for Europe and, and uh, um, uh, creates a lot of new you know, possibilities for Europe and, and, and even you know, you know, have greater security of supply. And as, and, and as you say, this is a, the only corridor that is not controlled or the, the only uh, pipeline bringing energy to Europe from Asia that isn't controlled by the Russians. It, and it doesn't go through uh, Armenia, which is which is Russia's which is Russia's ally, so when when, when they were threatening uh, uh, the pipeline, basically in July, as as you say, do you think from their point of view, it, this was just um, uh, I want to say their point of view. I mean the Armenians. Well, I'm actually asking who's the they. Is it the Armenians and the Russians, or the Armenians acting? with the a nod from the Russians or the Armenians trying to pull in the Russians? And is it, is it just a defensive move uh, to, uh, to make the Azerbaijanis feel vulnerable in that area? Um, or, or do they actually have hopes possibly of, uh, of shutting down the, the, the gas corridor? Right. So, you know, I, I think that um, I can't tell who was winking and who was nodding. So maybe maybe Matt can uh, give us some some in, insights into that. But um, you know, cl clear, clearly, uh, um, if Armenia initiated this, is something that probably uh, Russia would find that it's it's val it's valuable. Um, you know that it, that it, that it's in its in its interest, and we certainly wouldn't want to stop this kind of you know uh, activity. But like I said, Armenian officials were very clear with this doctrine of the new you know uh, new new wars for new territories, and I think that you know, it's, it's kind of whether it's observers from outside who you know who said we were sort of stuck in what. Um, Armenian military looked like in the you know in the 90s versus Azerbaijan, which was basically at the time really didn't have a military. You know the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it really didn't have any forces. It was more you know sort of group, groups of, of militias and things, and really no one doing any serious look at how things had changed. So I don't think it's just um, the introduction of uh, Israeli and, and Turkish uh, drones and other technologies. I mean, first thing, you have also production of drones as a domestic indu in industry in, in Azerbaijan. I think that actually helped people really gain operative abilities and also that they didn't have to be, you know, ship ship or, 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 or uh, you know, brought in dur during the war. Um, but I think it gave them a lot of operational capabilities. And, and this is, I mean, this is a war that I think will be studied for many years. It's maybe the first real state-to-state -state war with 21st century type uh, patterns, whether it's you know, the, the, the way drones were used, the way they were integrated into the battlefield. Um, you, know, you talked a bit about you know, climbing up cliffs and, and, and hills, but actually in some parts of the war, this actually neutralized this whole meaning of being on the heights, you know, in, a, in a sense, uh, the, the technologies that were used. Here you had in, for instance, another 21st century, you know, the uh, direct attacks on civilian populations. So with, you know, Armenia sent uh, SCUDs, grads, um, you know, on, on civilian populations outside the battle zone, Ganja, Barda, uh, mainly made in order to try to actually get uh, uh, Azerbaijan to attack back on its civilian populations and, the, and then trigger uh, the defense pact with Russia. Um, you have uh, also what I would think is something we definitely need to look into future you know, researchers of war, weaponization of, of energy infrastructure. So no mm -hmm. more just 
energy, like that you, you energy infrastructure and war, oh, you want to deny energy, but actually, you know, uh, threatening to attack the Amiga Shever Dam and, and flood extensive parts of Azerbaijan. Uh, July, after the July 12th fighting, uh, a low level Ministry of Defense spokesman uh, in Azerbaijan saying, well, we'll, uh, we'll attack Metsamor if you attack our dam, that's a nuclear power plant. And then recently, all over the Armenian press, ideas that nuclear waste from Metsamor should be used to produce dirty bombs and, you know, and, and, and uh, basically make uh, Baku uninhabitable. And this, you know, produced, this is published in the United States as well in the newspapers, you know, I can imagine if someone else was sitting and said, hey, let's produce dirty bombs, you, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't find that this is like a tolerable statement and, you know, and, and uh, but, it, but somehow it's, it's, it's um, so, so I think we're definitely having this new period of weaponization of energy infrastructure. I have to start thinking about Iron Dome type technologies for dams and war zones, nuclear power plants. And I hope even as a part of peace in the future, um, that there will be some sort of monitoring stations on Metsamor nuclear power plant in Armenia, just for even leaks for, uh, you know, maybe let's give the Minsk group something to do, uh, you know, for, for <laughs> leaks, for, for, for any kind of destruction there. You know, and the saddest part here is, you know, Armenia has been very adamant that it needs to keep Metsamor because of its war with, with Azerbaijan, but it's, it poses the biggest danger to the people of Armenia, 35 kilometers from Yerevan. I don't know why they would want this Soviet era uh, nuclear power plant with no secondary shield, whose life has been extended way beyond its, you know, its, its design life. And uh, so. Okay, so uh, uh, when I come back to you, I'm uh, uh, like to follow up some more on this question of drones, and in particular the Israeli connection to the uh, to to the whole conflict. Uh, but let's move now to uh, Mr. Obali, and uh, Mr. Obali, you are uh, the founder and the uh, managing director of Gunaz TV, uh, which is a very interesting station. Uh, you are. Um, your home is in Chicago, but you broadcast actually into Iran, um, and uh, and you are a um, a refugee from Iran. Or, uh, um, I don't know is refugees the the word you would use. Uh, you escaped from Iran, uh, made your way to the United States, uh, and um, uh, you are a South Azerbaijani now. Um, I wonder if we could just start by uh, discussing that concept a little bit. I think uh, many of our viewers are probably not aware of uh, who the South uh, Azerbaijanis are and why we Americans should be paying closer attention. So um, could you just uh, describe yourself and your people a little bit for us? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, uh, I'm from, as you said, from uh, Iran, a Northwest part of Iran that's called Azerbaijan, uh, but in order to distinguish, to make a difference uh, for viewers, uh, Azerbaijan Republic is in the north, which is independent Republic of Azerbaijan that broke away from former Soviet Union. And the, the other part, we call it South Azerbaijan to uh, make sure that people understand when we say Azerbaijan is not automatically the northern part. Uh, so I, I escaped from Iran. I was born uh, in Ardabil, uh, which is northwest part of the country, right on the southern part of the river, Aras River. Uh, I, I, I went to high school and during the revolution, I was one of the participants, at least uh, in various cities. So one, right after the revolution, I escaped the country uh, because they were basically uh, trying to apprehend as many uh, people as possible, as long as they were against the, the revolution or against the current government. So I escaped, went to Turkey. And um, uh, after spending closer to four years in Turkey, Italy, Yugoslavia, of all the places in Europe, basically, I was able to immigrate to US, got a political asylum as a refugee and moved to US in late 1985 and have been living in Chicago since 1986. So after working with a uh, few uh, human rights organizations, I um, realized that our people need to know their rights, human rights and ethnic rights, which is part of human rights. So I set up a television station, uh, a small uh, television broadcasting. It's not, I, I, I won't even call it a station. It's small enough 
that can be operated from a single room. Uh, but mm. nevertheless, we, we are able to, we've been able to broadcast uh, to that part of the world, focusing on Azerbaijan, uh, South Azerbaijan, uh, for since 19, uh, since 2005, 2005, and has been going well. Uh, but the, the amazing thing as, about the, the amazing thing about your station, from from my point of view, is that you're you're in day to day contact with people on the ground in 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 Iran. Yeah. I don't think I don't know anyone who um, is as well informed as you are about the currents of opinion on the ground. Um, uh, particularly in that northwest quadrant of Iran, which is uh, almost entirely populated by uh, by uh, Azerbaijani uh, Turkish speakers. So yeah. uh, um, one of the things that uh, you, I've become clear to me from talking to you is that there's a that there's a, a kind of a national awakening going on there. Um, but what's what's hard, uh, I think, for uh, me to understand or, um, you know, anyone who hasn't actually been there in Iran to understand to what extent, uh, what, what, what are the what's the um, what's the goal goal of the um, uh, of this awakening? Or is there a goal? Is there a movement, I guess, is a, a, the way to ask? Or um, is it just a desire for um, uh, greater cultural aut autonomy? I mean, what the what I hear from a lot of um, uh, Middle East experts is that the uh, Azerbaijani population of Iran, although it is very large, possibly a, a quarter of the um, entire population, that's very well integrated into the state. Uh, and that there isn't a lot of disaffection. I think you're going to tell me different, but could you help us understand what what is the what's the current of feeling among the people on the ground, and how has the war influenced it? Well, uh, in order to uh, address this issue, we have to start with the uh, understanding of Iran as a country. So Iran is a multi-ethnic country. Uh, the difference between Iran and other multi maybe some of the other multi-ethnic countries is that all the ethnic groups in Iran are concentrated in a specific location that have been living there for years, maybe hundreds of or thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So in the Southwest, we have Arabs uh, from that, live, that have been living there for, for years, thousands of years. Uh, that's where the oil come from uh, in Iran. In a little bit north of them is Lors, and then a little, little bit north of Lors, we have Kurds that, that is called Kurdistan. Lors, that is called Loristan. And then a little bit north of uh, Kurdistan, we have Azerbaijan that used to be called Velayati Azerbaijan, which, is, which mm -hmm. was a uh, sort of a federalist, uh, if you look at it, a federal system, Iran had five uh, federal states uh, during the late Qajar uh, era, uh, and one of them was Azerbaijan. Uh, that, uh, that includes uh, four uh, provinces of West, and East Azerbaijan, Ardabil, and Zanjan, which is attached to basically Tehran. So from Turkish border uh, in the west all the way to Tehran, from Azerbaijani border in the north all the way to Kurdistan and south of Hamadan, that's called Azerbaijan, you know, historic Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis are, or Turkish, uh, uh, Turkic, uh, people in Iran used to rule Iran for about a thousand years right after Arab invasion until Pahlavis came to power in, in late 1920s. So after that, the, um, uh, once the, 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 the power was uh, taken over by, by other uh, than Turkish tribes or Turkish rulers, uh, there was a, a huge Persianization uh, process uh, going, started going to uh, under slogan of one nation, one country, one language. So mm -hmm. all the other languages were banned in the schools and this Persianization process, the thought behind was uh, what was uh, to create a mono-ethnic, at least a unified nation. So that in, in the beginning, it it, start, it, it didn't backfire right away, but over the years, people are becoming more aware of their human rights, ethnic rights, mm. cultural rights, 
So this, this way, Arabs and Persians and uh, Balochis, Kurds, are, uh, Turkmen's in the northwest and the south, northeast part as well, and Azerbaijanis are uh, more uh, have started a a, a movement. It, it's not just a, a small uh, movement. It's a it's a huge movement that we've had since the. I would say right after, right before the revolution uh, of the constitutional revolution in 1905, 1911, uh, and then continued in 1945. Of course, we, we've had one uh, republic uh, that was there that created that was created for one year uh, from 1945 to 1946, and then that was overthrown. And then, of course, the Islamic Revolution came in. And right after the Islamic Revolution, Azerbaijan was the first uh, people, the, we were the first people that, that went against the, uh, the Vilayat al Faqi, which is the supreme leadership of Iran. Uh, that was suppressed heavily. So this, this is not a something, this, our movement is not new, so it, it has a history. But, but it really picked up and moved forward after the Soviet Union collapse the Republic of Azerbaijan, Independence Rep Republic of Azerbaijan. And, uh, and I think our television helped the movement tremendously in the last 17 years uh, by, uh, so therefore we can say there's a huge movement towards uh, self-awareness uh, and this war, uh, the war of uh, liberation we called, as it's called, uh, the, the recent one, uh, really, really moved the movement a uh, few steps up, notch up, where the, uh, it forced the Iranian government to actually change its policy. Iran has been helping uh, Armenia directly, openly, uh, and sending weapons even, du even the, during the war. From September 27th, when the war started, uh, Iran kept sending weapons and military trucks, equipment, uh, openly uh, through its borders to Armenia. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, uh, Azerbaijan is basically about uh, a little bit over a third of the population in Iran. So we had demonstrations on September 29th, and that we can go into this a little later, but that really forced the Iranian government to change the policy. I'll, I'll come back to you on the uh, Iranian government policy, but let me just uh, hone in uh, briefly on, on one thing you just said, uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there in social media I've seen uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, people who should know better, who are, who are saying that actually are, um, uh, Iran supported Azerbaijan because they're both, um, they're both Shiite countries uh, and uh, uh, and there are statements from prominent Iranian clerics and others saying that that they support their uh, their brothers, the Azerbaijanis, in the reclamation of their um, uh, of their territories from Ar Armenia. And I think that's the basis for some of this interpretation. And uh, can you just uh, put this to rest? That uh, um, this this idea that uh, that Iran is not the ally of Armenia. Well, Iran is actually still is ally of Armenia. It used uh, to be and it still is and will be ally of Armenia because of, of all the things maybe South Azerbaijan. Because Iran doesn't want a strong North Azerbaijan or Republic of Azerbaijan that will, uh, will help in any ways all the Azerbaijanis living in Iran. So the population in, in, uh, in the South is more... Uh, more of a pro-Azerbaijan actually because of the Iranian government's policies helping directly Armenia. Uh, Akbar Ganji, one of the dissidents or, or that used to be part of, the, part of the system in Iran, wrote an article once uh, saying that if there is a country called Azerbaijan, if it is even the size of our, our hand, it is still dangerous to Iran because Iran doesn't want Republic of Azerbaijan. Iran at first kept pushing to change the name 
from Azerbaijan to a, a different name, Iran or something else. Uh, that didn't uh, work. So as long as Azerbaijan exists, that will exist, we know, Iran is going to be against Azerbaijan because of South. And the, the Iranian government actually doesn't, help, doesn't uh, hold back or doesn't hide the fact that they're helping Armenia. The only time that they try to, to do is after, after September 29th which there were heavy demonstrations announced. Uh, and then all of a sudden they changed their uh, policies. Uh, to so when the, of, when, when the people of South Azerbaijan started protesting and they feared yes. that they were gonna have unrest on their own streets, then they threw a little out a little smoke with, with these statements that they're that they're supportive. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, actually, I, I don't wanna take a lot of time away from uh, our uh, great panelists, but just to, uh, uh, add to your point. So the war started on September 27. Iran was sending equipment, trucks, weapons, everything openly through Nordur, uh, Nordur's uh, cross, border uh, crossing to Armenia. And then the, the, our activists put these uh, Taped it, tape, videotaped those and put it on social media. The social media was exploding basically in protest. Why is this happening? Because there's a, still a war, right? Iran kept denying. So we announced a demonstration for, sept, for October 1st. So the announcement was on September 29th. Uh, on Tuesday, we announced that there's going to be a uh, nationwide or, or area-wide uh, in all Azerbaijani cities, there is going to be a demonstration to support Azerbaijan and ask Iranian government to stop sending weapons. Uh, so after the uh, announcement of, of this demonstration, it took about two and a half hours where Iranian uh, government came out openly in support of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and denying the, or, or, or saying that, well, we, we, we support Azerbaijan and we are not gonna send any weapons. They still did it. They still did it, but at night, not during the day. We know that for a fact. And as we speak now, they are sending more weapons, more trucks to Armenia right now. Huh, okay. can, can I just join in on this point of uh, uh, Iran's support uh, for Armenia? So two things on the statements that, that uh, some of, some of the, uh, those that are claiming that Iran supports Azerbaijan are saying that, but, but, uh, but Iran said it supports Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. So first thing, this is a position from 2012 that they came out with this officially. And actually that's just in line with the State Department, with the EU. I mean, there's not one government, including the government of Armenia that ever recognized Armenia's occupation of the of the of the Azerbaijan's territory. So supporting territorial integrity puts Tehran on the rhetorical level on the same side as the State Department, right? And and so it's it's not nothing exceptional. But of course, we should only be looking at actually what you do. What does it really matter? I support world peace. I support this, you know. But but if you have trucks of weapon, I mean, there's no land border between Russia and Armenia. That's a that's a fact. And they couldn't use air corridor over Georgia into Armenia. So every flight um, went through Armenian airspace and every uh, Iranian airspace, sorry, to Armenia from Russia. And every boat went for, with heavy equipment went in the Caspian from Russia to, to Iran's Caspian port taken by a contractor that happened to be an ethnic Azerbaijani that I've seen him interview talking about his 687 trucks a month that he was taking from Anzali port, uh, you know, it, it, to the border crossing with Armenia. This is a fact. So to say that some representative of the regime in Tabriz made some statement, that means it's stance, that's, that's pretty, it's, it's just- it's Well, just that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. And uh, yeah. uh, because I have a, um, uh, and it's a great point to transition back to the, to the ambassador, but I wanna reveal here, I have a secret uh, uh, agenda here uh, yeah. for, this, uh, for this panel, uh, which is that uh, I, want to, um, I want to end with us all discussing 
the strategic significance for the United States of mm. these of these events. And I and uh, Dr. Schaefer, what you have just said, if I can summarize it in one sentence, is that is that it's not just that Iran was delivering equipment um, directly to Nagorno-Karabakh from uh, um, from Iran to Nagorno-Karabakh, but that it was delivering Russian equipment. So it's actually a Russian Iranian Armenian alliance against uh, uh, against Azerbaijan. Um, uh, so I want to put that idea in everybody's mind, and we'll come back to it. And on that note, let's move back to the ambassador and let's talk a little bit more about the Russians, because, um, mm. Mr. Ambassador, I have a question for you, similar to what I asked uh, Mr. Obali, and that is, there are a lot of people who are saying um, that. Uh, Azerbaijan is actually not an adversary of Russia, that it's a, that they're they're actually working together. Um, and, and there's a there's a certain amount of um, uh, of evidence uh, to support that claim. I think more evidence than to support the claim that uh, uh, that Iran is uh, is actually the you know, supportive of Azerbaijan. Uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, Putin, to everybody's surprise, Recognized uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, the occupied territories and Nagorno Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. Uh, he didn't intervene to save the uh, uh, to, to save the Armenians. Um, and as part of this November 10th agreement, he's we've got now got Russian troops on uh, Azerbaijani soil as um, uh, as peacekeepers. So. <clears throat> Um, and in a way, you could I think you could say that um, that President Aliyev read Vladimir Putin much, much better than Nikol Pashinyan did. So can you unpack for us, uh, explain to us um, um, uh, uh, better these relations between Azerbaijan and, 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 and Russia? Um, are they are they actually allied in, uh, uh, con countries or is there friction, hostility between them? And where should uh, ultimately what I want to get to maybe in the next round after this is what's the what should be the U.S. attitude toward this be? Yeah, that's a deeply thoughtful question, Mr. Duran, as always. And uh, so I, I, I first of all, um, I, I think the fundamental preference of Azerbaijan's foreign policy since you know 1994. Uh, when Ilham Aliyev's father, Haider Aliyev, signed the so-called contract of the century, which is the oil and gas contract that opened up Azerbaijan's oil and gas sector to international companies. It's been balance, geostrategic balance. But from a perspective that to survive, to remain independent, Azerbaijan needs to connect itself as much as it can with the transatlantic community via Turkey, via Georgia and Turkey, sorry, using its energy pipeline infrastructure as a physical and economic connector, but simultaneously not alienate Russia. Mm. You know, we were just talking about Iran, right? I mean, Azerbaijan is the only country on earth <laughs> that shares a border with Russia and Iran. Uh, and it's a small country, right? It's 10 million people. And, you know, it's got nine different climatic zones and you can visit them all like in a, you know, five and a half mm. hour ride in your car. <laughs> it's not a big place. Uh, it's diverse. Uh, and it's on an amazingly geostrategic piece of the global map. So um, I think both Haidar Aliyev and Ilham Aliyev have tried to bolster Azerbaijan's ties to, to us, right, via Turkey, as much as possible using hydrocarbon exports, but also not alienate Moscow. And so moving up the clock, uh, uh, shortly or a couple of months before uh, the, uh, the, the second war in Nagorno-Karabakh, Ilham Aliyev, the president, he fired his former chief of staff, who was also his father's chief of staff, Ramiz Mehtiev, whom everybody who follows Azerbaijan knows was deeply, deeply pro-Russian. He had his personal business and economic interests based in, Russian, uh, in Russia uh, and was a force always pulling Azerbaijan's foreign policy closer to Moscow. But finally, President Ilham Aliyev felt okay I can get my own person in the job, Shakmar Mofsumov, who is the former head of the uh, oil and gas fund of Azerbaijan, uh, and then have some more breathing space. But nonetheless, Ilham Aliyev never, never wanted to alienate Vladimir Putin. And so unlike Georgia, which is near and dear to all of our hearts, at least on this call, um, you know, 
Azerbaijan never said it wants to be a part of NATO or it wants to be a part of the EU. Uh, when I was ambassador, um, the, the Azerbaijani government was careful to say, look, EU, you say to us, you get more engagement with us, more for more, if you do more on reform. And what Azerbaijan's policy was consistently was, we're not asking for more with the EU. We're asking for equality. Treat us as a partner. We don't need anything more. We're here conducting this balancing act. So just be our partner. So fast forward to today then. Um, I think that uh, uh, the reason why Vladimir Putin was so even-handed, hugely to the disappointment of so many Armenians and, and members of their diaspora is twofold. Um, one, a threefold, threefold. One is that unlike Georgia, Azerbaijan never made this, or unlike Ukraine, uh, a, a, a clear desire to enter NATO or, or the EU or the transatlantic community. Azerbaijan's being careful. Uh, number two, Nikol Pashinyan in many ways is, is Vladimir Putin's worst nightmare, right? I mean, Pashinyan, to his credit, he came to power as a democratic anti-corruption reformer came to power through people power, through popular uh, protests that garnered him huge uh, legitimacy. Uh, and, and he overthrew the old regime, right? The old deeply Soviet or post-Soviet system. That's what Putin fears more than anything else back at home in Russia. So for that reason as well, Putin and Aliyev had some, some common ground because of course Aliyev he, 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 you know, he's, he's not a fan of the Armenian leadership, although he and Pashinyan got along very well in their initial meetings in late 2018. But nonetheless, this is where I think where Putin saw that he had something in common with Aliyev in terms of, you know, Armenia and not necessarily being a clear partner for uh, Russia uh, under Pashinyan. And finally, in my experience as the U.S. mediator for, for the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, um, the one issue the only one that I could think of that I experienced in my time in the White House, just before you came, Mike, uh, and at the State Department, where we had true common ground with Russia was Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, hmm. as, as much as we disagreed on Georgia, as much as I, you know, what Russia did to Georgia would infuriate so many of us in the US administration, Russia was constructive and helpful on Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, you know, there are many reasons why. I, I think the Russian goal was maybe not to resolve the conflict, but not to have it blow up into a full-scale war like just happened. Because uh, the, the region being off balance, that's to Russia's advantage. The region being in war, that's unpredictable. And that's, that's even frightening for, for, for Putin, because who knows what's going to come out of that. So when Pashinyan began, as, as Brenda was talking about, and as I mentioned, and his defense minister, he, in early 2019, saying, I'm going to abandon this land for peace formula to resolve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I'm going to talk about, yeah, as you said, like uh, new wars for new territories. Uh, I think that uh, angered Putin because Putin and his government were were really were honest brokers up to a point uh, as Minsk Group co-chairs, and they knew that Pashinyan was rejecting that whole formula, and they didn't like it at all. And they saw, as as Brenda described what Armenia did in July, on July 12th of this past summer was reckless, reckless and dangerous. And it was an attempt to pull Russia into a war that Russia didn't want to fight. Didn't, and if you look at social media all over in Russia, like people are saying now, why, why should our boys die for this recklessness in Armenia? Do you think that the uh, Armenians, um, the Armenian leadership, uh, assumed that the Russians would intervene for them uh, if things got really bad? I think Pashinyan hoped against hope. He shouldn't have, because in July, when he asked for a special session of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, when some of the fighting in July had spilled over into Armenia, and this and is the, the CSTO, this is the uh, this is the, uh, the uh, C, uh, CSTO is the alliance between the alliance system of the Russians and the Armenians. Yeah. Yeah, Russian led with Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan. Yeah, uh, Pashinyan said, "Okay, guys, we have this. We have this pledge of collective security, like NATO's Article Five. Our territory has been attacked, so you have to come to our defense." And the CSTO essentially said no. That they issued an even-handed statement saying, you know, "We call on both sides to stop the fighting, 
rather than saying we come to the aid of our ally. I mean, like in our NATO context, right? That's that's impossible. If NATO territory is attacked, of course we all come to the come to the defense of our NATO ally. But in this case, I think Moscow saw that Pashinyan had provoked something, and he was trying to draw Russia and the other CSTO allies in, and the CSTO would have none of it. So he should have known. He should have known that the CSTO certainly wouldn't come to Russia, uh, Armenia's aid if it was attacking Azerbaijan's territory. But I think the oligarchs, the Armenian oligarchs in Moscow felt they were so close to the Putin inner sanctum that mm. they, could, they could manage the whole thing. And they failed. And that was, that was the ultimate hubris, you know, maybe in, Ar in Armenia's modern history, to think you could, you could, you could game <laughs> Putin's inner sanctum, or you could game Washington, right? They thought they had both sides to come to their assistance, and there was no chance either one would. It was just, I think, an example of, of how Pashinyan, you know, as a non-politician, as a journalist, as, 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 as a civic activist, was in way, way over his head. Well, then, then you see, how, you know, Mike, I saw this from your social media that you visited uh, Ganja and Barda and, and saw these attacks. So something that I'm not sure how much the international community knows. Armenia, in order to pull Russia into this war, attacked, you know, there's no military target to so the center of Ganja, uh, 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 parks, apartment buildings. You know, this this reminds me of, you know, Saddam Hussein with the Scud missiles trying to pull in other, you know, pull in Israel into the war so that it would break up the Arab coalition. So Armenia tried to do the same thing, you know, zero military targets, firing these missiles on, on, on civilian, you know, civilian targets, um, killing 100 civilians and hoping that Azerbaijan wouldn't have the kind of restraint it had, would fire back on Armenia. So meaning that he was willing to sacrifice also his civilians and and this would this then that could trigger bringing russia into the war because it would be armenia proper we have to remember this whole war was it was not one inch in the territory of armenia <laughs> it was all in azerbaijan's territory some of them occupied some of them um outside the war zone um and so when armenia tries to give you know and especially you hear this with the armenian american diaspora you know that how armenia was under attack not one person in Armenia itself or one inch of the, the state of our Republic of Armenia was touched. And I think, again, going back to Ambassador Bryce's point about restraint that, uh, you know, could you imagine how your, your civilians are being attacked and you and you hold back, you restrain, you don't attack, you know, back at, at Armenian uh, civilians, understanding that you don't want to trigger bringing Russia into the war directly. So um, can I ask you, uh, Ambassador Bryce, uh, the are the Russians winners in this war or losers? I think they're losers. I mean, I think they're, you know, they, they're winners within the Minsk group, right? The Minsk group is now dead. And it's like the, the mediator is Russia. I mean, de facto, even if the French and US co-chair, as wonderful as they are, showed up, Russia is holding all those Minsk group cards. But if you think about it in a broader geopolitical sense, wow, I mean, Russia has lost so much of its good faith in Armenia because the Armenians feel abandoned. In Azerbaijan, there's always there's always a certain amount of you know deep skepticism, even not a certain amount about Russia. But what else happened? Turkey, for the first time, as I said before, in a hundred years, is going to have a military presence in the South Caucasus. And by the way, it's accepted by Russia under the, the November nine and ten agreement. So. Um, if, if you're Washington or Paris, you might think, oh, we don't really trust the Turks and they're in cahoots with Moscow. But if you're Vladimir Putin or a Russian geopolitical thinker, there's Turkish troops are NATO troops, right? I mean, it's NATO's second biggest military. So I hope we wake up in the rest of NATO and realize this is a huge opportunity for the NATO alliance. Um, it's a geostrategic uh, setback for the alliance, for our alliance that Russian peacekeepers are on the ground. I mean, we all know how nefariously they behaved in Georgia and Moldova. And they've been, you know, since my time in the Minsk group and been trying to find any way they can to get a presence on the ground in Azerbaijan. And, I, you know, in my day, we really opposed it all the time. In this case, there was no alternative. There had to be some peacekeeping force immediately available to separate the Azerbaijani and Armenian forces. Only Russia was available to do it. And only the Russians would provide enough confidence to the Armenians 
to return to Nagorno-Karabakh. And that's what they're doing. And that's great. That That's the great victory, right? If Armenians return in great numbers to Nagorno-Karabakh and live side by side our, with Azerbaijanis, we have a whole new beautiful geostrategic and geoeconomic uh, set of options to bring Azerbaijan, Turkey, Armenia together. That's a great thing. Um, so uh, in any case, Turkish military forces, peacekeepers on the ground, that is NATO presence. And uh, they counterbalance the negative aspects of having Russian peacekeepers on the ground. I, I, I just want to hone in on one little issue and then I'll um, move on back to, to Mr. Obali. And, and that is, um, if, if we just looked at, uh, at your answers to the questions today, um, to the first question I ask you and, and to this one, uh, you might, one might come to the conclusion that, uh, that uh, President Aliyev invited in the Russian peacekeepers and is happy mm. to have them there. But um, it seems to me, uh, you, you made the point of strategic restraint, but it seems to me that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, 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 gonna make, I'm, I'm saying this as a statement, but it's a question. He did it under the gun. Yeah. He was afraid that if he continued to push all the way to uh, Khan Kandy, Stepanakert, uh, and if there was a lot more loss of life, that we would, he would actually have gotten a Russian direct military intervention. And so what, the, the, what he had to weigh was, was overreach that would, that would trigger a Russian intervention, um, uh, combined with all of the, the, the killing you mentioned that he, that, that, that he avoided. And he and and he he waited and he said, "Okay, I have to accept these Russian peacekeepers. Um, it, it's it's not it's not ideal, but it's the, the the best of a of a difficult situation. Is that how you see it, or am I reading it wrong?" So I completely agree, Mike. Completely agree. Yeah, he didn't want them. In my experience, you know, dealing with them for actually a couple of decades, <laughs> he realized what a negative factor they could be, those peacekeepers. But it was the price he had to pay, and I think. You know, as you and I have discussed, I, I believe that there were signals. Well, I know there were signals being sent from Moscow that if the Azerbaijani forces pressed on to Khan Kendi, Stepanakir, there would be some sort of Russian military intervention. And additionally, if the Azerbaijani forces were to take the Lachin corridor, were to capture it, also there might be Azerbaijan, uh, there would be Russian intervention because for Putin, while he didn't ever want to alienate Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's the grand strategic prize in the South Caucasus for Russia, because you know Russia is already so embedded in Armenia, not so much in Azerbaijan though, and Azerbaijan is so much richer in many ways, he didn't want to alienate Azerbaijan either. That said, he also knew that it would be a huge loss for him domestically in Moscow, politically, if he were to be seen as totally abandoning Armenia by virtue of letting Azerbaijan take the Lachin corridor. So there were real constraints on him uh, on, on Aliyev, he knew that Putin would intervene potentially. He, I don't think he wanted to accept the Russian peacekeepers, uh, but then he realized not only for the reasons I just said they were necessary, but also because I think Aliyev, as he said throughout the war, genuinely wants Armenians to c feel safe enough to return to Nagorno-Karabakh. And I think he reluctantly realized nobody else was available to provide the peacekeepers to allow the Ar Armenians to feel safe enough to come back other than the Russians, who historically have been seen as Armenia's protectors against the Turkic neighbors. And you know, it is, it is quite sad that if, we, if there's already gonna be foreign peacekeepers that it wasn't a joint you know, US-Russian force, how that would look you know, entirely uh, you know, different and how if this was, you know, 10 years ago, you, you would see this as, you know, the U.S. as a major, uh, you know, player, but, but really it, U.S. is completely, you know, missing from activity in the South Caucasus. You know, um, uh, we're, I, I see, I'm looking at the clock here and, and I see that we have already eaten up the time that I said I was going to uh, um, uh, devote to this, but I, I still have a, a number of very important things I want to, I want to hit. So with your permission, um, I will continue to do a, uh, continue around, go uh, uh, Mr. Obali, Dr. Schaefer, and then one last round of, uh, of summing up the strategic importance for the United States a very, in a very pithy fashion, but that'll take us another, I don't know, probably 20 minutes. Am I, are you okay with that? Everybody's okay? Anybody not okay? We can edit out this little bit here where I'm uh, asking you this question. You're okay. 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 All right. Great. Thank you. Good. So, uh, Mr. Obali, um, 
I just asked the question about whether Russia was a winner or a loser in this. Um, it seems to me that uh, Iran is a, is a big loser uh, and a bit sore. Uh, and uh, I wonder if I could uh, get you to analyze what's going on on the ground there in Iran and the, how the Iranian government is thinking about this. And maybe a good way into this is this controversy that just erupted uh, 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 when uh, uh, famous... President Erdogan of Turkey <laughs> recited a poem in Baku at the uh, Victory Day celebrations, uh, um, expressing, uh, lamenting the division of the Azerbaijani people by the Aras, uh, by the Aras River. Uh, and this has caused a lot of discomfort in, uh, in, uh, in Iran. And maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about that and, uh, and then explain in general how Iran is thinking about this strategically. Well, well, Iran is a big loser, as you uh, mentioned. Well, first of all, Iran is a big, big loser in general, but specifically when it comes to Azerbaijan and the, the reliance that Azerbaijan had, if dependence that Azerbaijan had on Iran is evaporating very fast. With this uh, agreement, with uh, the trilateral agreement that Azerbaijan signed, effectively moved Iran out of the area for sure but also moved Azerbaijan away from Iran even further. The corridor between Nakhchivan and, and Republic of Azerbaijan is going to open not only Nakhchivan, connect Nakhchivan to, to Azerbaijan, the mainland, but also Turkey and Western countries through a corridor that is not going to go through Iran. As you know, Azerbaijan relied on Iran, not only to go to, uh, to basically manage Nakhchivan. Uh, the, the people traveled through Iran to Nakhchivan. Uh, the air, airplanes went through Iran to Nakhchivan. The air corridor was through Iran. But also uh, Nakhchivan relied on Iranian gas, you know, swapping gas. Uh, and now that's going to change as well. As you know, there is a sorry uh, for uh, for interrupting you. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that uh, for the for those who are uh, watching and are, don't have the map in their head, uh, Nakhchivan is an exclave of Azerbaijan. Um, it it it's uh, Azerbaijan is separated from Nakhchivan by by Armenia. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, like just like Alaska is separated from 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 the, the continental United States by by Canada. And in order in order then to have connection, a direct connection with with Nakhchivan, all of this um, people and 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 goods, but also energy had to go through Iran. And now that's all changed. That's going to change for sure. It's, it's a 35 kilometer long uh area that wide area that separates Nakhchivan from Azerbaijan that is called southern Armenia so the corridor is going to go through there uh, as you know bef before the uh, November uh, agreement uh, uh, Iran tried to mediate again as they did in the in the past but whenever they me mediated they tried to mediate between Azerbaijan and Armenia Azerbaijan ending, ended up losing more, more land to Armenia. Mm -hmm. So this time, uh, Iran went to, Javad Zarif actually went to Baku, to, to Russia, and then back to Armenia and went back to Iran. And uh, they had a plan apparently uh, to mediate in a way that Iran would be part of the uh, settlement, maybe uh, reconstruction of the area, uh, maybe even part of the peacekeeping force. That didn't work. Uh, Iran basically was literally kicked out of the whole conversation, the whole uh, settlement and everything. And Turkey basically took over. So Iran not only lost uh, in Azerbaijan, but also in, internationally lost again, as they said, as you also mentioned, they're sore. Uh, so the, all the uh, activities in Iran, all the writings in Iran is basically comparing what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh recently to Astana uh, uh, agreement that uh, about Syria that Turkey basically took over uh, what Iran was trying to do. Uh, as you know, Iran also lost um, big time after the, uh, uh, the famous poem was recited by, by President Erdogan. Uh, they lost 
because they expose their weakness so badly uh, that the, all the other countries in the world should be aware. Iran has a big, big problem on ethnic issues. Uh, Azerbaijan is about, Azerbaijanis in Iran are about uh, 37 to 40% of the population. Uh, the former uh, Minister of Education in Iran, Haji Babai, which is, uh, he's a uh, deputy in the parliament now. At some point when he was a Minister of Education said, that se over 70% of the students in Iran are not Persians. So this whole <laughs> idea that Iran is majority Persian is actually not true. But that, that's a different uh, argument that can be discussed later or some other time. But Iran has now exposed it, itself by overreacting to a, uh, reciting a, a point uh, that uh, now they're trying to fix the problem. It's the, as, as, as we say in the West, genie is already out of the box already. So Iran uh, is going to work so hard to bring, the, the, to, to bring Turkey back uh, to where it was before the famous reciting of the poem. I don't, I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, Turkey is aware that Iran has been helping and is still helping Armenia. Turkey is aware that Iran is helping PKK. Turkey is also helping, uh, Iran is also uh, helping other groups that are against Turkey and Azerbaijan. So all of this is, is exposed. So Iran lost big time, I, I think, internally, internationally, and in the neighborhood as well. How do you uh, how do you expect the uh, the regime to respond to this loss? What what um, what can they do to uh, regain some status uh, in the in the discussion? And um, uh, you know, in in theory, what can they do? And what do you expect they will do? Well, I, I think Iran tried hard by bringing all those military equipment, military personnel to the border right before the agreement. Uh, they they were trying to. Uh, use their force as, uh, you know, being to, as a uh, tool to being part of the equation. And while that didn't work. So Iran, I think, is completely out of option. At this point, Iran doesn't have anything to force Turkey or Russia or Azerbaijan or, or even Armenia, as, they, as Iranians say, they even lost Armenia. Uh, uh, not only Azerbaijan, but also Armenia is lost. So Iran is at, the, at this point is out of option, I think. They, they're hoping, they're hoping that uh, with uh, working maybe with new ad administration in the, in the White House, they're hoping that they will get out of this encirclement uh, that may open up another venue for them. But that's good wish, I think. Good, good, good. Good luck with, with that also. The neighborhood has changed for sure. Iranian, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis in Iran are uh, all uh, aware of, of their strength now. Uh, they're, they're more boldened, I think, after the demonstration that forced Iranian government to change their policy, at least on surface. So Iran is completely out of option at the moment, I think. Does, does it bother the um, does it bother your people by which I mean the uh, uh, the, the Azerbaijanis of, of, of Iran does it bother them that um, that Azerbaijan was receiving uh, military uh, uh, supplies if not uh, 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 training from Israelis no actually not it actually we, we've had a few shows about uh, Azerbaijan getting help not only from Turkey, uh, technically or militarily, well, equipment-wise, but also from Israel. The southern Azerbaijanis, for, for the most part, are very pro-West and extremely pro-Israel. So what the Iranian government has done, you know, this, this current uh, system or regime has done in the past 40 years, they have managed to destroy Islamic religion in Iran, number one, because a lot of people are, uh, are fed up with what the government is doing. So in Iran, uh, the population is moving away from
from what Iranian government does. That's Islamic rules. So in fact, Iranian government has damaged to a certain point, maybe even destroyed this religion in Iran. But Iranian government also has managed to make sure <laughs> indirectly, to make sure that the Iranian people are very much pro West and Israel. So <laughs> if, if Iran was shooting to move people away from West and you know, make, it, make sure that they're against Israeli government, that, that has completely backfired. I don't think Iranian government wanted to do this, but the result is people are pro-Israel, especially Azerbaijanis. We had many live shows that people called in from Iran, say, from, from South Azerbaijan, saying that, thank you, Israel, for providing assistance to Azerbaijan to free or liberate the occupied land. Uh, thank you, Turkey. Thank you, Israel, is actually a main, one of the main things. So uh, in Iran uh, or in, in, in southern Azerbaijan. So a lot of people, I think, in South Azerbaijan are willing to take Iran, uh, Israeli flag, Turkish flag, hold, their, uh, hold them up just to basically to let the government know that. To stick it to the government. Further, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Dr. Schaefer, you are actually uh, an expert on uh, Azerbaijani Israeli relations. Um, and I, I wonder if you could unpack that for us a little bit. And you, you're also, I think, an expert on, on Turkish-Israeli uh, relations. And uh, how do you, um, uh, if we look at this from an Israeli point of view, why why is um, uh, why is Israel supporting Azerbaijan uh, to begin with? Uh, and uh, what does that portend for relations in the future with with Azerbaijan, but also with Turkey? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, a few things to, po to follow up with uh, Ahmed's uh, points about uh, what I would call Israel's soft power, uh, really, in, in, in Iran today. And, and I think that this, this issue of Iran's support for Armenia has really been a watershed, both internationally and, and domestically, for, for the regime. Um, in, in, and, I'll, and I'll bring into the connection here, here to, to Israel as well. So first thing, on the, you know, on the ideological level, who in Iran can believe that the Islamic Republic supports Palestinians' rights to statehood, to, to not be under occupation, when not only does Iran buddy-buddy with China that's you know, oppressing you know, a, a million Uyghurs, right? But when you can see the trucks of arms going in to support Armenia that has you know, kicked out a million Shia from their homes, and these might be relatives, you know, have, you know, th there's family ties that extend beyond the borders between Republic of Azerbaijan and Iran, people that even know their relatives that, you know, lost their homes uh, in the war. Uh, physically, you know, we saw these really hundreds of day on a daily basis, hundreds of Iranian Azerbaijanis going to the border, uh, the, you know, return border of the Republic of Azerbaijan with Iran, welcome, you know, cheering on the soldiers. So, you can't really believe the ideology of the regime. Hey, we support Muslims. We support downtrodden Shia. We care, but we don't care about these million, this million Shia next door to us, your relatives. Uh, but we care about ones, you know, uh, thousand three hundred kilometers away. So I think that it's very hard to make the argument, you know, domestically that anyone is, you know, serious in, you know, in Iran about, uh, you know, sincerely supporting the Palestinians and not just something instrumental or to build up an image of, of, of uh, ideological uh, purity. Um, and, and let's recall that uh, Iran's support for uh, uh, Armenia predated the honeymoon between uh, Israel and Azerbaijan by, by about six to seven years. So only in the mid nineties did really those relate, the relationship between uh, Azerbaijan and Israel start uh, to develop beyond the you know, diplomatic relations, but really to a, a more strategic relationship. But Iran already in, in 1993, you have really clear statements, including one of the most vocal at the time was Mahmoud Vazi, who today is a foreign policy advisor to, uh, I believe to President, President Rouhani, uh, stating very clearly that because and of- Chief the, of Staff, by the way. Chief of Staff? Yes. So because of the domestic Azerbaijani threat, I mean, no, no sort of 
push, you know, uh, uh, trying to kind of, uh, you know, try to hide this in, in any way. Um, you know, because of the domestic Azerbaijani threat, we have to support uh, Armenia. Uh, we can't, you know, it's, uh, it's better Azerbaijan is involved in a war and not interested in, you know, this mi minority. And at the time, Azerbaijan had a very um, extremely nationalist government that was uh, sort of making overtures to South Azerbaijanis to, you know, to this whole uh, d domestic question. So, so that the, the, uh, the, Iran's position against Azerbaijan has nothing to do with Israel. A lot of people think they say, oh, because Azerbaijan is close to Israel, Iran took a different stance. It, it actually highly predated you know, any of the romance between the relationship. The relationship between um, Azerbaijan and Israel actually, again, some see it as just transactional or oil for arms and stuff. I see it you know, completely uh, uh, differently. I think it's multifaceted. I think that um, that there, that it's you know, that not. I mean, they're they're Israel is one of Azerbaijan's top trade partners. Um, yes, there has been this very strategic oil flow at a time when you know getting oil into Israel was a lot more you know challenging. There was this sort of ongoing um, oil supplies, but even on everything about you know, if a Israeli professor comes to Baku, gives a lecture. He's treated, you know, way before we had this sort of uh, love fest with the Gulf states and stuff, it's always treated as a normal, you know, a normal person, as a normal, you know, when, when so, there was so much, you know, delegitimization of Israel, um, you never felt this uh, in Azerbaijan. And I could say also for many Israelis, you know, growing, like when people uh, living in periods like with the intif intifadas and the terrorism and, and stuff, going to Azerbaijan and also at the time also going to Turkey, I think it reminded many Israelis that the conflict was really a territorial conflict between Israel and the Palestinians and not a greater conflict between Islam and the Jews or Islam and Israel. I think it was a very important part of our self-awareness of self-awareness of Jews um, and, and, and Israelis. And I think also many of these, are, these, I mean, these very welcomed uh, openings now to Israel um, happened thanks to this long-term love affair between Israel and Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan sort of, dem there was like a demonstration effect that they could have a very close relationship with Israel and nothing's, you know, they're not gonna have an Islam, even though there's many religious people in Azerbaijan, they don't, they don't tend to be anti-Israel. That's not sort of a motif, even a very believing Shia in, you know, in Azerbaijan. It wouldn't create a domestic problem and it really didn't create an international problem uh, for, for, for Azerbaijan. You, you know, so it sort of, it showed what's possible. You can have these good relations between a Muslim majority country and Israel and nothing happens. And in fact, the opposite, if you say today, even as results of the war, you know, having this, uh, links to Israeli technology and, 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 and again, on a very uh, intimate level, uh, you know, enabled, uh, you know, Azerbaijan to fulfill uh, its, its strategic goals. Um, so what about the, uh, uh, for me, uh, one of the interesting things about this is that it shows uh, the, this being the Israeli-Azerbaijani relationship. It shows the overlap in uh, strategic interests between uh, Israel and Turkey. Uh, because, uh, you know, as Ambassador Bryza uh, told us, the Azerbaijani military couldn't have done what it did. And President Aliyev couldn't have uh, carved out this um, uh, uh, sphere of independent action were it not for the power of Turkey. But we're hearing a lot these days um, that uh, Turkey is no longer an ally of the West. Uh, and that Turkey is an inveterate enemy of, uh, uh, of Israel. Uh, and and uh, I personally don't agree with that. I suspect you don't either, but I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts um, about the, what this portends. Does, if anything, the Azerbaijani-Israeli relationship uh, for the Israeli-Turkish relations? Yeah, Mike, I think you make a really important point here in that um, uh, not only are Israel and Turkey on the same side in the Caucasus um, and almost every regional conflict, whether it's Libya, Syria, uh, um, um, conflicts in, in, in the Middle East, but actually there's zero bilateral issues of uh, dispute between Turkey and Israel. There's no border problem. There's no refugee problem. There's no religious uh, holy site issues, right? All their, 
all their issues of, of con uh, conflict are actually related to third actors or third conflicts. So whether it's uh, uh, Turkey's ties to the Hamas or, or wider Palestinian movement, Israel's ties to Greece and UAE, um, but there's nothing where Turkey and Israel have to decide, okay, where should the border go? Where should the peacekeepers be? Where should the refugees return? None of these really big, tough issues, only about third parties. And in fact, a lot of countries, a lot of allies, have they agree on core issues and they disagree on a lot of other issues. I could even say that even Israel and the United States, you know, probably one of the most closest ally, you know, alliances around. And there's tons of issues that they disagree about, whether it's, you know, Chinese investments in infrastructure in Israel and um, you know, and 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 and, and, and other and other, and other issues. So of course, when Turkey and Israel, if they sat down, they think, gee, what what do we how do we solve our problems? They don't have it's zero problems. They don't really have any. Um, and it would just take the will to think out of, you know, not thinking about in both places of domestic politics, not, you know, figuring out ways that um, you could say, yeah, we, um, you know, we, we, um, we might disagree about relationships with uh, some third party actors. Um, of course, certain things, you know, if it's any support for violent movements, you know, or something where it would affect the security of, of each other, I, th I think those are obviously red lines, but again, they don't have any direct conflict of security interests. I've already noticed that Turkish media, official media has already really uh, toned down how it looks at Israel. And especially in this conflict, you see it over and over again, the Turkish media, how Turkey and Israel were on the same side, how Turkish and Israeli technology worked really well together, and even attacks that how, well, while Turkey and Israel on the same side, Iran was supporting Armenia, meaning that they were on the other side. Um, so I think there is a lot of signaling, you know, via the Turkish media as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've taken a lot of time here. I want to take just one more quick round uh, and uh, um, wake up Washington to the strategic value of uh, Azerbaijan to the United States. That's my, uh, um, that's my uh, hidden agenda here with this uh, panel. It's now I've let it out. It's no longer... Uh, it's no longer hidden, but I really, um, uh, I've been saddened to see how uh, asleep the United States has been about this, uh, this conflict and, um, and, and uh, seemingly uh, uh, unaware of the tremendous advantages that just fell in its lap uh, because of the efforts of the, uh, the sacrifices of the Azerbaijani uh, military uh, and the uh, the efforts of the the Turks and the Israelis and and others. Um, I suspect you all agree with me. Maybe you don't. Uh, but uh, but let's just um, have a quick appreciation of the strategic value to the United States of all that we've been talking about. And I'll start with you, Ambassador Breiza. Uh, we already know about the oil and gas pipelines, the Baku Tbilisi cars railway, the highway that runs through this Tovuz region where, where the fighting in July uh, occurred, that basically it's the lo second longest highway in Europe that connects uh, Biarritz on the French Adria, uh, Atlantic coast with the Kyrgyzstan Chinese border. So that, you know, that, that's been a centerpiece of US foreign policy for a couple of decades, the, the transportation infrastructure, especially oil and gas. Um, but I think this, or and I think this agreement of November nine and 10 uh, highlights a few other factors. One is is Iran, as we were just talking about, as as Ahmed and 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 Dr. Schaefer were saying, um, having this new corridor through the Armenian district of Megri that unites Nakhchivan and the rest of Azerbaijan that hugely undermines uh, Iran's influence in Azerbaijan and Nakhchivan. I mean, I I remember being sort of shocked uh, when I visited Nakhchivan the first time when I was serving in Azerbaijan to realize how much stuff gets to Nakhchivan from or via Iran, including like bottled water, you know, like everything. The, the, the most economically efficient way to get to Nakhchivan from the rest of Azerbaijan was through Iran. So yeah, as both, as the, the, both of my colleagues were saying, this is a huge blow to Iran's influence in the region. Um, okay, granted, maybe, maybe uh, president like Biden will want to have a new opening to Iran to get back into the JCPOA, but all of us here realize the nefarious uh, impact that Iran is playing in many places. And you know, when I, my, when I left Azerbaijan in, in, in uh, uh, January of 2012, an extremely senior Azerbaijani official, not the president, but really high up said to me, 
we are de facto at war with Iran. Uh, that changed, but Iran's nefarious influence throughout Azerbaijan was was really evident to me, uh, including on the personal uh, counterterrorist front. So that's that's one one plus. Another plus, as I mentioned in one of my interventions, is that uh, based on this agreement, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey, or, or Turkey now, NATO now has military forces present in Azerbaijan. That's That's got to mean something great for the alliance. And instead of rejecting that as some sort of a, of a ploy between Erdogan and Putin or Erdogan, Putin and Aliyev to do something against U.S. interests, I think we should wake up and appreciate how Moscow looks at it as a geostrategic setback because NATO troops, Turkish troops are on the ground now. Um, another reason why it's Azerbaijan is important, but also this agreement is important because it puts to rest this, this huge flashpoint in the South Caucasus, again, where all this uh, infrastructure runs through. Um, the agreement is fundamentally fair because it's basic principles were agreed already by Armenia and Azerbaijan and Pashinyan tried to walk those back. Uh, and then a fourth issue, and I'll have one more, I'll be a fifth one, is that there's a huge opportunity now, as I said before, to open, based on the ninth point of the, the, the agreement, all the uh, transportation connections involving Armenia with Azerbaijan and Turkey. There'll be massive opportunities for investment in all sorts of infrastructure, energy, and road, and rail. But finally, why Azerbaijan is so strategically important. Oh, I'm sorry, it was a sixth one, which is, you know, it served as this transport corridor along with Georgia uh, to Afghanistan and onward, Central Asia and Afghanistan, uh, throughout the whole Afghan war. I mean, one third of all of U.S. materiel made it to our troops and NATO, other NATO troops in Afghanistan via the Georgia-Azerbaijan corridor. Uh, but the final reason why Azerbaijan really matters outside of the context of this agreement is that Azerbaijan is a Shiite, overwhelming majority Shiite country, right? Uh, with, as, 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 as uh, Mr. Obali was talking about, that this deep sort of interconnection with Azerbaijanis in Iran, with 20, 30, 35% of, of Iran's population, the Supreme Leader, Rafsanjani, others were ethnically Azerbaijani. Um, so a very diverse country uh, with you know, 2000 plus years of, of Jewish presence in Azerbaijan. And I just for a second diverge, I, one of the most beautiful moments ever in Azerbaijan was talking to the Lubavitcher um, rabbi there. I said, I, how do you feel about, how comfortable are you in Azerbaijan? What, what's the situation with anti-Semitism? And he laughed. He said, you know, sometimes I worry there's too little anti-Semitism in Azerbaijan <laughs> because we can't build a sufficient sense of community as we can in other places. <laughs> so what a magical place at this moment of such division in the world and going through what we went through since September 11th. Uh, you've got a country that has these traditions of religious, not just tolerance, but like full commonality of culture, right? Shiite, Sunnis as well, uh, all kinds of Christian faiths. I'm a Roman Catholic. I mean, we have a beautiful church in Baku that you know Pope John Paul II uh, consecrated, uh, the Jewish community and this Shiite overwhelming majority, yet everybody lives together in harmony. What a great example for the region. What a great alternative to <laughs> Mr. Obali's uh, original country. He's now my my fellow compatriot of Chicago, a fellow Chicagoan, but what a great alternative uh, development model that Azerbaijan uh, is. So a lot of reasons why this is an important moment. Oh, uh, fascinating. Uh, so Mr. Ovali, let's, uh, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to uh, 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 Dr. Schaefer. And uh, can you uh, give your closing remarks about uh, what you think the strategic implications of this are? Right. So first thing, just pick up a map. Look where Russia, Turkey, Iran meet. You know, one global power to, or, or two very important regional powers, right? And they meet in the South Caucasus. So of course the US, uh, if you care about anything that has to do with Russia, Iran, or Turkey, you, you'll wanna be there and be an important player in the South Caucasus. 
Um, second, uh, uh, Iran, and just and again, I think that this is a if for years those same researchers on the Middle East, Mike, that you mentioned, that say that uh, that the ethnic issue isn't important, I would say that one, you know, why do we think that identity politics is important and salient and in, in the United States, for instance, that for generations was, was a country actually of civic identity, of American identity. And now in a period where em definitely emphasizing, you know, uh, different communal identities, why do, we, why do we recognize that change? But we couldn't imagine a similar change happening in Iran. And I think that again, this war uh, was a game changer for the ethnic Azerbaijanis in Iran. And, and if let's say Kurds, Arabs and Baluch for generations um, don't feel part of Iran or by and large not part of Iran um, and it's sort of been battling Iranian rule, but they're relatively small. And the big, you know, so the big question was always, what about the Azerbaijanis? And again, when you see your own country arming, uh, you know, that the country fighting the soldiers of people you consider at, at minimum your cousins, if not your brothers or, or, or more, um, I, think, I think that's a watershed. Um, third, I would echo what Matt said about the uh, Muslim world, you know, that if, um, you know, I, I think post September 11th, the US was very careful uh, under, under President Bush to really signal that uh, we have a war with Al Qaeda, we have, you know, with terrorism, we don't have a war uh, with, the, with the Islamic world. Um, obviously, the Obama administration was, you know, even maybe went to even more of extreme and not even, you know, calling it uh, Islamic extremism or Islamic terrorism, which is saying terrorism and extremism, right? But something happened, I, what I felt during this war that I actually, if someone who grew up in this country never, you know, would never experienced it. And what is a little bit of a taste of, I think, of a Christian foreign policy. And I think that's very uh, dangerous. It's, it's not it's not the American uh, way in the sense that um, uh, Armenia, Arme Armenian American lobby was really using the Christian card. You know, America should support us because we're Christians. Uh, we deserve to stay uh, in Karabakh because there's churches there. Um, and, you know, I could never imagine, uh, let's say an Israeli giving an argument, oh, we should stay in the Gaza Strip because there's an ancient synagogue there, which there is. We should stay in South Lebanon because there's ancient synagogues there, which there are. You know, really, geopolitics should not be set by not where a mosque is, not where a synagogue is, not where a church is. As Matt pointed out, people should we should preserve these, you know, preserve these uh, places of worship and historical buildings, regardless of who who the government is of, of, of all uh, minorities. So I think we really need to make 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 it clear that you know we, we, the U.S. has to set its policies based on its principles, its interests, but not you know normally on you know well if a group's Christian we, we should we should uh, we should assume that they're somehow persecuted, which which isn't which isn't the case. And then last, I would go to the. I would quote a great geopolitical mind, which is uh, Dr. Michael Doran. Um, when you started getting involved in the looking at the South Caucasus, and I, I asked you, what, what do you think? You said, geopolitics of the South Caucasus is simple. Armenia has a defense treaty with Russia and two Russian bases in, in Armenia, and, and Armenia and Russia have a joint uh, air defense. Azerbaijan doesn't have Russian bases, doesn't have a defense treaty with Russia. It has its own uh, air defense. Armenia has excellent relations with uh, Iran. Azerbaijan has poor relations with Iran. You said the geopolitics are simple. So to quote Dr. Doran on that one. Well, uh, um, how can I disagree with that? Uh, I can only disagree <laughs> with one thing. You just said only a great mind. Is that it? Just great? That's all? The greatest? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so last but not least, uh, Mr. Obali, what are your uh, closing thoughts on the geostrategic significance for the United States of this, uh, of all that we've been talking about? I think uh, Azerbaijan's importance uh, should be taken into account deeply from now on. Azerbaijan may look as a small country in the region. It is bigger than uh, both Georgia and Armenia economically and land size. Uh, Azerbaijan's uh, economy is uh, 1.5 times bigger than both Armenia and uh, Georgia combined. But Azerbaijan should not be looked at just that small country. Azerbaijan has influence in both uh, in, in, uh, in, in the neighborhood, in Iran, through over 30 million Azerbaijanis that live in Iran. Azerbaijan has great influence, and it was shown during this war as well. 
Azerbaijan has influence uh, even in Turkey, but more importantly, Azerbaijan has influence in, inside Russia as well. So uh, Azerbaijan should be taken uh, seriously, especially after winning the war, uh, Azerbaijan uh, is, is becoming uh, more important. So it, it, is, it would be in US national interest in uh, not uh, giving into uh, diaspora, diasporas of certain countries, including uh, Armenia, uh, and then overlooking uh, its own interests. Uh, if we are looking at maybe um, opening up, a, a, elongating the, the corridor that is opening through Naxivan to all the way to, to Northern China, that it would include all the Central Asian countries, Azerbaijan's importance is becoming more and more. So I, I think it is significant that Azerbaijan won this war, but it is more significant that Azerbaijan did show its importance in the region and, and in the world. Uh, well, uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Obali and uh, Ambassador Bryza. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Thank you. I took much more of your time than I intended to, uh, but I think it was a very valuable discussion. I hope to see you back here sometime soon. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dr. Ron. I loved it. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye. Great to be with you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.